All right, awesome. Um, so I want to uh, just have a chance to go through the syllabus in a little bit more um, detail. And so you guys saw last class, the general overview of the sorts of problems that we wanna be able to solve. Um, but I'll talk about that um, in a bit more detail. Um, and then we'll have, we'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about like why deep learning, like why we decided to, to focus this class on deep learning. Um, and so first of all, I wanted to talk about the course requirements. Um, and so this is a project-based course um, in which um, you'll have a chance to work throughout the semester to execute your own novel data curation pipeline. Um, and so this could take different forms depending on your interests. Um, so you could convert a raw data set or data sets. It could be of images, it could be of text uh, that you wish to use in your research or is like the sorts of data you think uh, you would wanna use in your research. Um, and you'll take that raw data and convert it into computable format using uh, uh, some type of deep learning based method. Um, the outputs might include you know, a GitHub repository of your code, a data appendix um, that describes the data curation pipeline. Um, this data could be used subsequently for um, a third year paper or for a term paper for another class, for a thesis, for a dissertation chapter, um, or it could just be, um, you know, data that you want to practice on that you don't know if you necessarily want to use that data in your research, but it just gives you a good opportunity to get hands on experience. Um, you know, alternatively, you could create an open source library um, that provides the research community with a well-documented tool um, that relates to, um, uh, to um, preparing data at scale. Um, or, you know, for those of you who have the sufficient background, you could work to develop and validate a novel deep learning based method uh, for social science data and submit the results of that to a machine learning conference, you know, write up a paper. Um, so it could take any of these formats and like we're really flexible because the main goal is that this is something that is useful uh, to you. Um, and so you can work with your own, on, sorry, you can work on your own. You could work with external collaborators if there's a paper you're working on with people outside this class um, and you'd like to apply the methods, some of the data that you need. Um, or you could work in groups with other people in the course. Again, really the important thing is that you get something uh, useful out of this. Um, and so there will be three progress reports where you just describe the progress you know, that you've made, do a short write-up. Um, it gives you a chance to ask questions or talk about where you're stuck. Um, and then a final product. Um, and those will count equally uh, towards the final grade. Um, in terms of compute, um, so Microsoft Azure uh, provides $100 in credits free of charge to anyone with a valid .edu address. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, for those of you who think that your research is likely to be pretty um, heavy on deep learning, I would recommend looking into grants, could be from your department or other sources that could subsidize the cost of a GPU. Um, because if you're gonna do this very often, like having your own machine ends up being usually quite a bit cheaper. Um, you know, the pain um, for it in the cloud. Um, the cloud is really useful. Like, say you wanna, you've developed a method, you've trained a model and you wanna scale it up on hundred million images. You know, well, that's an example where you wanna use lots of cheap CPUs in the cloud because it would take you forever to run it on hundred million images locally. Uh, but in terms of like GPUs for training, um, they tend to be pretty expensive um, to use remotely relative to like, if you were using your own like on a per hour, per hour basis. So that's just uh, worth thinking about. Okay, um, so now I'm going to um, talk a bit through the course schedule. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, come to where we see um, the reading list. Um, and so um, we're starting out with an introduction to deep learning. And so today I'm going to talk about um, why the course is focused on deep learning, why not focus on more traditional methods, um, and kind of what are the pros and cons of those traditional methods as compared to deep learning. Um, why do alternative methods fail where deep learning can be successful? Um, and then on Monday, um, I'll turn to an overview of deep learning. And obviously this is going to be at a pretty 
high level um, since it's an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but I just want to give you guys a sense for the general concepts and how they fit together. Um, if this is something that you're not already familiar with or you haven't thought about it for a while, um, I would recommend doing some reading on your own um, just so that it's less of a black box. Um, and um, so there's an online book um, called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, which I think is a good introduction if you're not uh, super familiar with deep learning already because it kind of gives you a sense for how different things fit together. It has some math, it's not horribly technical, um, but I think it, it, it gives you a sense for um, kind of the general overview and why does this make sense? Um, there's a textbook called Deep Learning that is essentially kind of like um, the um, benchmark reference in the field. So think of this a little bit like the MWG book would be for micro. It's kind of like the standard text, um, but I think it's best suited if you already have some familiarity with deep learning. Like then you kind of see that, oh, it's the author's perspectives on this and it's really helpful, but sometimes it has a little bit the feel of like being a little bit like a laundry list of different things you need to know without talking so much about how they fit together. Cause I think it's kind of assuming that you already have a sense for that. Um, it also has an introductory part that um, teaches the applied math concepts that are required. Like if you wanna understand um, what's going on with deep learning and it's a pretty good refresher. Like if you've done the first year of the economics PhD program, you're likely to be pretty familiar um, with those kind of basic concepts, um, but but it's a it's a nice um, a nice refresher and kind of introduces the notation. Um, another book that I uh, highly recommend, um, regardless of your background, is um, a book called uh, Deep Learning with PyTorch, um, and so it introduces the concepts and shows you how to implement them in PyTorch, uh, which is just um, super useful in terms of actually being able to. Um, apply things. Um, and you can find just numerous lectures available for free online. Um, there's a lot of material out there. Um, and then finally, I included a review article that was written for Nature by the leaders of the field that gives a nice overview and a blog post um, that summarizes kind of the key uh, milestones in deep learning over the past decade. Some of those are things that are relevant for this course, some aren't, um, but you'll see some of those papers uh, come up on the reading list as well. Okay. Um, and um, after we finish an overview of deep learning, um, we'll talk specifically about convolutional neural networks, which are going to form um, the basis for all of the object detection things that we do. These are neural networks that are particularly well suited to images. Um, and so uh, first of all, here I put a paper from 1998 um, that's just kind of a classic paper. Um, and so like by way of overview, the ideas that underlie deep learning um, were already around in the 80s, um, but at the time there weren't really large label data sets. There certainly wasn't computing. Um, on the scale that you have today. So it was kind of this like esoteric thing. Um, but, you know, I've cited like one of the classic references. I mean, then we kind of move forward to the present and introduce um, like five different frame, like five different architectures um, for CNNs. And so the last two ones are the ones that are kind of the most modern ones that we'll use. Um, but we'll talk in the lecture about this kind of whole series of papers um, that led um, to the current architectures. Um, and so this is gonna be kind of like just the background methods lecture to kind of give you a sense for what is going on under the hood. Um, and then we're going to apply this um, to image classification um, and again, uh, you know, citing some of the leading papers here. Um, something that's gonna come up a lot is that um, in deep learning, like the way the field evaluates its progress is that there are these benchmark data sets. Um, that's true for object detection, that's true for object classification, that's true for all sorts of NLP tasks. Um, and we'll get familiar with what those benchmark data sets are because you're gonna see them come up a lot. Um, 
And we, we talked a little bit about this last class too, about how this is how, um, how computer science um, tends to work. Um, and I think like you'll see in some of these papers, they make some like massive like improvement on the benchmark data set, which is usually indicative of like a model that's done something that is gonna transform the field that like works very well. But then you also see lots of papers that make like very marginal improvements on the benchmarks. And in those cases, I think it's like not necessarily so useful um, to, to, to what you may wanna do, because if there's a huge improvement that's reflecting kind of something fundamental the model is doing differently that's working well, probably. Um, but if there's a small improvement, they've just probably found some way to tailor that model towards that specific data set. And it's not really clear that it's going to extend. Okay. And so then, you know, with that background, we'll talk about object detection. And we're gonna focus specifically on the FAST RCNN series. Um, but because we find that like one of the, those models just has the best performance um, on documents um, through a lot of experimentation. There's other object detection frameworks out there, but this one has good performance and it also has really good code, um, which is something that I'm gonna encourage you guys to care a lot about because you can spend a lot of time debugging code that just doesn't work or wasn't very well written. And so if there's you know some new thing that makes you know, at that point, hopefully you guys will understand the basic kind of approach that we want to use, but then how do you actually implement that on your data? It's one thing to know, okay, these models exist, but then how do I go about, um, how do I go about implementing them? Um, and um, so a key thing is that, you know, especially for this object detection, those are, um, you know, those are, um, uh, supervised methods, you're going to need labeled data and labeling is costly. Um, and whether or not something's feasible for you to do might well depend on how much you can reduce those labeling costs. Um, and so, um, well, how do we go about doing that? Um, the main way is through active learning. Um, and we'll talk more about what that means um, and how active learning can be applied to our documents, which is a bit differently to how you'd apply it, you know, if you were a researcher at Facebook trying to do active learning for tagging faces and images, um, et cetera. And that's what most of the literature has done. Um, but we'll talk about it in the context of documents. And then we'll just also talk about some like practical hacks um, for how to reduce annotation costs with just the goal of converting some um, conveying some practical wisdom um, to make labeling as um, feasible and uncostly as possible. Okay, so at that point, you guys will understand these are the models. Here's how I can label. Um, so once you have the framework um, that you're going to use and you have your labels, how are you going to actually fine tune? Um, and we'll talk about that in a very kind of uh, practical sense in this lecture um, to um, kind of um, understand, okay, now I'm ready to apply this to my data set of images. What do I do? Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of main part for document layout analysis. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll speak very practically about like, okay, so document layout analysis, you have, you want to find the coordinates of different objects and you want to find their categories. How should I define the categories? so that it's gonna give me the information I need, but it's not gonna take any more labels than necessary. And that's actually super important too. And so there's just like a lot of practical knowledge that is not you know, anywhere on the internet um, because not many people are doing this on documents and we'll try to um, convey that information. And then at that point, um, we'll shift gears a little bit to think about image pre-processing. Um, and so, if you're working with document images or even with natural images, uh, there can be a significant amount of noise. Um, and you know, there, there's a literature out there kind of for how to deal with that in the context of natural images, less so with document images. Um, but um, one thing we found that works really well is um, GANs, um, which you've probably heard about kind of in the popular press. And so the most famous example of a GAN is like, how do you turn a picture of a horse into a picture of a zebra? And you feed in the horse and it um, you know, um, outputs a zebra. Um, they've gotten a lot of attention for being able to create um, images of people that look like people, but that aren't actually people, um, for being able to create like fake 
uh, like forgeries of artworks, things like that. Um, and so we want to use this for document pre-processing. And so the basic idea behind the GAN is that you have a set of images that are dirty, so to say. They have like a lot of noise in them. And then you have a set of clean images. So you might have um, a set of document scans that have text bleed um, and other noise. And you have a set of document scans that are very clean scans. They were taken with a very high quality scanner. Um, and they're not, they don't need to be paired. They can be from different, sort of from different publications. And then you train the GAN to be able to turn the noisy images into the clean images. And this can make a big difference um, to OCR accuracy. And it can also make it kind of less costly in terms of labeling to do layout analysis to recognize the structures in the documents. Okay. At that point, we'll shift gears um, to talking about OCR. Um, we'll talk about you know, an overview, what are the challenges, what are some hacks that you can use um, to make OCR much more accurate, um, and how would you design your own engine if you were going to do that. Um, you know, at that point, once you have OCR, um, that gives you digitized text. So is there a way that we can incorporate that text into layout analysis? When humans look at, say, a table, part of the reason they, they know what they're looking at is that there's the text there. Whereas recall in kind of the traditional um, object detection framework, we haven't recognized the text yet. We're just using features of the images. Um, and this is an area that there's really like almost no literature on. But we'll try to speak a little bit practically about how you could bring the text um, into understanding the layouts of your documents as well. Okay. At that point, um, we'll shift gears uh, for the second half of the course um, to talk about natural language processing um, with an emphasis on the cutting edge models that have really revolutionized the field in recent years. Um, and so we'll start with an introduction. We will talk briefly about static embeddings, um, word to vec um, which is a model that probably um, many of you have heard about at one point or another, um, but we'll spend most of our attention uh, focusing on uh, the more recent models. Um, we'll talk about the Transformers paper, which is a paper that has uh, revolutionized uh, NLP and cover a range of models. Um, so Google BERT, um, which kind of kick-started this whole literature with massive improvements in performance. It's what underlies Google search. Um, and then there's a variety of other models um, that you've heard of if you've done NLP. So uh, XLNet, Albert, Distilbert, Roberta, Sentencebert, T5, uh, Big Bird. Um, so there's like a Sesame Street uh, theme in uh, Google naming its NLP models. <laughs> For some reason, it's a little odd. Um, and so the aim is to understand the general architecture of these models and the advantages and disadvantages of using them. If you have an application, which model do you go to? Um, which model do, do you want to start with? Um, and so there's various readings here um, about those frameworks. Um, and then we'll delve into understanding um, what's in an NLP embedding. What do these models when they embed text, like what do those embeddings capture and how do you think about that? Um, which also relates to how we think about visualizing embeddings, like what's the tools we use to visualize embeddings and what are we looking at um, with those visualizations? So we kept kind of a lot of idiosyncratic papers here that do like a good job of, um, you know, giving insight into what information um, that embeddings um, contain. And then we have some resources for how you can visualize embeddings, right? Which obviously isn't trivial, like bird embeddings or something like over 600 dimensions, you know, how you project that into a, you know, two or three dimensional object um, that you can visualize and what information is in that projection. Okay, then we'll spend a couple of lectures talking about sentiment analysis. Um, you know, the kind of predominant and traditional way to do sentiment analysis is training a classifier. Um, but we'll also talk about zero, zero shot classification, which is just a really recent um, advancement um, in unsupervised learning. And we'll talk about some other approaches as well. Um, and then we'll spend a couple of lectures talking about retrieval, question answering, and topic classification. 
So let's say that you're starting with a huge database. You have, you know, like 100 million articles, you know, or even smaller than 100 million, still a lot. Um, the, the first thing you need to figure out is how to retrieve the information you need. Um, and we'll talk about a me method called dense passage retrieval, which was recently developed by Facebook. Um, this relates a lot to like question answering and to search. Um, you know, so it, really like a huge driver behind the development of these NLP methods is search, which is why Google has kind of been the, the leader um, in developing methods. Um, and so um, this will allow us to focus on that. The zero shot stuff that we saw for sentiment analysis can also be pretty useful for topic classification. Um, there must have been a lecture on NLP um, on noisy data, um, which is something that um, is potentially important, um, but there's not a ton of work on it. Like there's been some work done on tweets and there's a version of BERT called uh, BERT tweet. Um, there's been less on OCR errors, which is likely to come up in our context as well. Um, and so we'll talk about some idiosyncratic um, uh, papers that, that, that do exist um, that um, uh, Jake was able to dig up from a conference on noisy user-generated text. Um, and then finally, um, for the last um, lecture, we'll do something kind of fun, which is image captioning, um, which lies at the intersection of computer vision and NLP. Um, and so it uses deep learning to generate captions from images. And so you can feed the model a bunch of images. Maybe you went to the web and you scraped images of you know what, whatever um, happens to be of interest to your research. And then you want to generate captions for those. How would you do that? Um, and it's kind of like an interesting combination of kind of the, the computer vision and the NLP methods that we talked about. Um, and then in the final three lectures, um, we'll have um, presentations um, where you get to give a brief, um, you know, approximately like five minute elevator pitch um, about your project for the course. Um, um, and so I want to talk today um, at kind of a general level about why deep learning. Um, why am I focusing on deep learning based methods and not using like some more traditional based methods, um, whether for uh, processing documents, for NLP, et cetera. Okay, um, and so generally speaking, there are two different approaches you can take if you wanna have automated data curation. Um, so you could write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data, and those instructions consist of a series of rules. Um, or you could let the computer learn how to process the data by feeding in empirical examples and using deep learning. Um, and rules definitely have their place. Um, and if you use them carefully, they can make data curation easier um, and more efficient. Um, but in many cases, like our experience has been that deep learning tends to lead to more satisfactory, more usable results you know, and by the way, this is kind of like true more generally. Um, a lot of the technologies that we take for granted today, you know, whether it's search, image, um, image tagging, text to speech, kind of that underlie most things that you would do on your phone, um, those are all using deep learning and it wasn't really possible to do those things before deep learning. Um, and so I think that, you know, at least for me, um, the intuitive reaction that you have when you see a document or you see some text that you'd like to process is to search for a set of rules. Um, and by rules, I mean user-defined parameters that govern how the information that you have, that raw information, is converted into something that is computable. Um, most off-the-shelf computer vision methods for document layout analysis are based on rules. Um, most tools used in post-processing um, implement rules um, and methods commonly used by a lot of social scientists, economists for text analysis, such as searching for a particular keyword, um, also use rules. And so 
they're kind of very common and what most people are likely to be familiar with. Um, so I want to give an example of how we would use rules to process a document. Um, and so this example is taken from a compendium of Japanese biographies. This volume was published in 1953. Um, I know you guys mostly probably don't speak Japanese, but that's good. Um, when we're at this stage, this is an image. We do not have the text and we cannot get the text until we recognize the layouts because um, that's the first step to being able to digitize the text is to figure out where it is, right? So the computer doesn't read Japanese either. Um, we are going to process this document based on its visual signal. And so you can see here, there are five rows in this document. It's in Japanese, so it's gonna read from um, uh, top to bottom and right to left within the row. Um, and then there's several different types of information that you can see visually in the document. And so you see the large font, that's the person's name. And next to that is their title. And then to the left of that is their biography block. And so essentially the way this, fun, this document works is it's a bunch of biographies. It has the person's name and title and then their biography. And then there's a space big font, name and title, biography, and so on and so forth. Um, and it has these bi biographies for like, you know, 50,000 people. So I've zoomed in a little bit. Um, and you can see here, um, the green is a given person's biography. And overlaid on the green, the red is what we call the title block. It has their name which is in the big font in their position. Uh, the blue is the biography block. That's the block of text that contains their biography. And then within the biography block, there are individual columns, um, which are shown in brown. And let's suppose we wanted to use uh, rules to um, segment this so that we can separate out each individual's biography. And then within their biography, we can separate out um, the title region with their name um, from the text region. And that's gonna be important because if you don't separate that out, it's not gonna OCR um, because um, the OCR engine gets really confused when there's different sizes of fonts. And so I've shown here um, A, B, and C. A is the space between two different individuals' biography blocks. B is the space between their title, an individual's title and their bio block and the, the bio portion. And then C is the space um, between lines. Um, and so like, let's suppose that it's always the case that A is bigger than B is bigger than C. And so the biggest space is between the, the blocks for two different individuals. And then within a block, the space between the title and the biography is um, larger than the spacing between individual lines within the biography. If that were true, we could just segment the documents using thresholds for these parameters. We would determine empirically what's A, what's B, what's C. Um, and then we would just set those um, threshold values and be able to segment the text um, accordingly. Um, and it would be kind of very simple. And looking at this document, you might kind of naively think that that is true. Um, so this approach is great. It's very straightforward to grasp, um, but it has two substantial disadvantages. So if it is not always the case that A is greater than B is greater than C, that there's uniformity in that spacing, um, relatively speaking, then the approach is going to fail. Um, even if it works, it only works for this specific document. So if you have a different document, you have to have different rules. Um, and so this is important because more generally, uh, rules don't usually scale because they require a lot of very domain specific user inputs. Um, what you learn from one document doesn't help you to process another document. Whereas a huge part of the power of deep learning is what's called transfer learning. What you learn from one set of documents on you know, helps you a lot to process other documents. So even just taking the model off the shelf that's been trained on, you know, natural images, on photographs of people and cats and whatever, um, it's gonna get you, you know, it's gonna give you garbage, um, but it's still gonna get you a lot closer than if you initially, if you just um, randomized your initial weights. Um, 
And kind of if you start in a model trained on documents, you'll ha you, you, it will require even less information from you um, to work. Whereas that's not true of rules at all. Um, each time you process a document, you have to come up with a new set of rules. It's not a method that's kind of scaled towards big data. Um, okay, so if this were a modern document made with a word processing template, it would probably be the case that A is greater than B is greater than C for everywhere in the document. Of course, if it was a modern document made with a word processor, um, you wouldn't need to digitize it. Um, and unfortunately, for a historical document like the one above, um, more often than not, there will be exceptions to the rules. So in the case of the above document, there's many different exceptions. Um, and in general, like a uh, strict adherence to document formatting is the result of modern computing. If you go back even to the mid 20th century, um, humans manually laid out the printing press and unlike a Microsoft Word template, uh, humans usually did not adhere strictly uh, to the rules. Whereas a template, like a Microsoft Word template kind of by definition is a set of rules. Okay, so I'll talk about kind of a more realistic rules-based approach. Um, and my motive for talking about this is just to give you guys an intuition for what rule-based processing may look like. Um, so that, um, you know, we'll spend a lot of time talking about deep learning, but I wanted to give you an intuition for rules. Um, and so there's a variety of steps to this. So you start with the page image, which you see is the bottom um, layer in that figure. And the first thing you have to do is detect the page frame. And so you see that like black border around it. That is from scanning, right? The edges of it, there's no page there. And so it, it's black. And the first thing you have to do is get rid of that because that's going to really screw up any rules you would try to apply. Um, and um, so you have to detect the page. Um, then you need to detect the different rows. Um, if you recall from the image I showed you, this publication has five rows. You need to detect those. Um, and then you need to detect the individual text blocks within the rows. And then you need to classify those text blocks um, and you may need to refine them based on the classification. Finally, um, you need to figure out the reading orders if you wanna assemble them into usable data. Um, and you need to have quality control um, to determine have you done a good job or not, or is this data that you've produced just basically noisy garbage. Um, and so this is another way of seeing that. You start with the raw image on the left. And first of all, you detect the page frame to get rid of that black part around where it was scanned. Then you detect each of the five rows. Then you detect individual title and bio blocks into the, in, within the rows. Then you classify and refine those. And so let me talk about how you would do each of these steps. Um, and so if you want to figure out what the page frame um, box is you use something called contour detection. You group pixels with similar visual properties like color or intensity. Um, and the largest intensity contour um, in this context denotes the page boundary. Um, you know, the part around the edge of the boundary that's all black is low intensity. Um, you're going to estimate the coordinates of those, which is going to make a quadrilateral, and then you're essentially going to, um, to de-skew that. You're going to turn that into a square with a transformation. Um, so once you've done that, now you have the actual page, you've gotten rid of the boundary um, and you need to be able to segment the rows and different blocks, the text block and the title block within a row. And so to do that, you use kind of what are the traditional kind of computer vision rule-based methods for segmenting documents which are called connected component labeling and run length smoothing algorithm. Um, and um, so first of all, you do that um, horizontally to separate the rows, and then you do that vertically to separate blocks within a row. Um, so let me give you a little bit of intuition for how that works. You're gonna binarize the image. So turn it into black and white. Um, you can see if there's noise that, 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 um, that could be a problem. <laughs> Um, but you know, let's assume that that works. You binarize the image and then you invert it um, so that the text is white 
and what's white space in the original document, which is how you're going to figure out the layouts is black. Um, and then you change white pixels to black pixels if the number of adjacent white pixels is less than C. And so that parameter C, that's your, that's your rule, right? That, this is why this is a rule-based method. Essentially what this is doing is just linking neighboring black areas that are separated by less than C pixels. And the reason you choose C is there's gonna be some noise in the scan. There might be some text bleed, et cetera, that's coming through to the white space. Um, um, and um, so by choosing that parameter C, you're kind of smoothing out that noise. Um, and um, so if we're splitting the page, we know that we need to look for the four largest connected components of black pixels. Remember that the image has been inverted. So those would have been white on the original image. Um, and that delineates the white space between the columns um, in, in this image. Um, and so once you have these blocks segmented, you need to classify them. Um, and so we use a three class CNN classifier um, that's trained to identify three types of regions, the text region in the bio, the title region, and a wrongly segmented region. Um, and so we're using a bit of deep learning here, but this is kind of deep learning light. This is pretty basic. Um, if if um, a block is classified as missegmented, we need to um, split it again to correct it. Um, and so this kind of helps us to correct some of the errors in segmentations. And then we'll further separate out that title region into the, the, um, the person's name and the person's occupation, um, which again can be done using the same method of um, CCL, where you're essentially looking for white space and using that white space to segment. Um, and so in order to train this classifier, we need to hand label samples. Um, and missegmentation doesn't happen a lot. And so um, we can rebalance the data set by manually creating missegmented images. Because if the model only sees three examples of a missegmented image, it's going to have a hard time uh, predicting it. Um, and we're able to achieve pretty high accuracy um, and then we need to predict reading orders. We need to figure out if this did a good job. And so we can do that by um, computing some statistics about the blocks and pages. Um, we find that the number of layout elements is fairly consistent across pages. And so if you see outliers and how many elements you're detecting, that's an indication that there's some sort of problem. And so therefore you can filter by those elements. Um, obtain a limited number of misselection candidates, since obviously like the whole point of this is like, it's big data, you're not gonna go through the entire, you know, 3000 page book. And so this allows us to kind of hone in on, um, on samples that are likely to be problematic. And so you can see, there's just some weird stuff that happens because this is like a book, even though we have a super high quality scan, you see some examples of that there where there's like a stain on the page or it's been bent or it's really bled through, you know, and that's going to cause problems <laughs> for a rule based approach. Um, okay, and so this is a pretty good case scenario for a historical document scan the layouts are pretty simple it's just like title, biography, title, biography, title, biography. It's much simpler than say a table. And it was a very high quality scan. We had the library send it to a company that specialized in preservation scanning of historical books. They removed the binding, which reduces a lot of distortions uh, from scanning. Um, and yet there's still a fair amount of manual correction involved due to the exceptions to the rules, like the ones that I showed you on the previous page. And so our motivation was to use rules on this volume to create labeled data and then use that data to fine tune a layout detection model that could be very quickly and easily further fine tuned to other volumes of the same publication. So we do this on 1953 and then we have 1939, 1940, 1955, 1961. We could use the, that the essentially labels that we created by using rules to segment 1953 to train that model. And this could be an efficient way to get labels. Uh, if you have one document that's pretty clean, that resembles other documents that you'd also like to process, um, 
we wrote a paper on this that was uh, published in a leading uh, computer science conference. Um, but I'd say that like it's not obvious to me ex post that this was easier than just hand annotating and just doing deep learning all the way through. Um, but the general idea could apply um, if you have the right context. Um, you know, this was a big part of our, uh, our motivation to develop tools and resources that make implementing a deep learning based pipeline easier because it can be kind of a little bit intimidating to do from scratch, but if you don't have to reinvent the wheel, it's much more straightforward. Um, I'll say a word about like if you want to apply these rule based methods, they can mostly be implemented through a package called OpenCV. Um, CV for computer vision. Um, and so if you want to do rule based computer vision, you should look up the documentation for this package and go from there. There's lots of resources about it online. Okay, I'm going to give another example. Um, so um, it's pretty common when you see economics papers using text for them to use rules as well. And kind of the main way that they do that um, you know, is through looking at whether particular words appear. Um, you might see how often a particular word appears in a particular newspaper and use that to proxy something. Like a macro papers have used this. Like, like go to the Wall Street Journal and see how often like uncertainty or um, words proxying uncertainty appear in the Wall Street Journal and use that as a measure of macroeconomic conditions. Um, and so as with document layout analysis that we just saw, like noise and complexity are going to disrupt the results of rule-based NLP like this. Um, and so if you're working with a historical document that's been OCR, but also if you're working with like user inputted modern text, what so could be tweets, you know, reviews, um, there's likely to be like OCR or uh, spelling and grammatical errors, and they can take many different forms, which makes them kind of difficult to just filter out. Um, and that's going to wreak havoc with a rule-based approach. Um, you know, perhaps an even bigger problem is just language complexity. Um, there's many ways to say the same thing and slight nuances in how you say something can make a big difference. Um, and so a rule-based approach like keyword search will struggle to tag relevant information if you're in a context where there's complex vocabularies. Okay, and so this leads me to like what I term the rules trap. And so the way the rules trap works is that you look at a document initially and think, oh, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward to process this using rules. I don't need to do anything fancier. That's going to work. But the problem is that you have not understood the full complexity and noise present in the document. And later on, once you try to process it, you discover that there are many exceptions to, this, exceptions to the rules uh, that you defined. But you think, oh, you know, I could fix these exceptions with more rules because any given exception you see, I could write, I, I could write a rule that accounts for that. Um, and then, <laughs> you know, you keep going and then you realize there's still problems. There's exceptions to the exceptions. Um, and even if at the end of the day, you've achieved high accuracy, this approach takes a lot of user inputs, which means it's gonna take a lot of your time um, that are very tailored towards that specific application. It is not going to scale to another document. Another document will have different types of noise. Um, even if they're only slightly different, it's been um, designed based on all these specific rules and it could completely kind of fall apart. Um, so this is not to say that the rules trap uh, always emerges. Um, some documents do follow clear, simple, exploitable rules, but I think that you just need to be aware of this and proceed cautiously and ask yourself whether it could be worth um, implementing a more scalable solution that may save you time in the long run. Okay, um, so um, here I want to give you an example where a carefully chosen rule actually can distinguish information that you want and it will save you time. And so, you know, I've had the kind of cautionary word 
Um, but that's not always going to be the case. Um, sometimes rules actually um, are useful. And so this is an example from a historical publication of firm level reports. Um, again, this is in Japanese, but don't worry about that. Remember, we're working with image data. Before we can OCR the text, we need to know where the text is. Um, and so the computer uh, can't read the Japanese either. And so you see here, the different colors are different classes of text. And we're trying to extract those based on their visual signal. And so obviously the ones in red are bigger and bolder. Like those are the titles. The neon green, you know, there's a little parentheses around those to distinguish them. Um, but one thing that, that, that is really hard to distinguish um, you know, are not trivial to distinguish from the visual signature is the pink versus the green. And so the pink are names of variables that appear in this table. Um, this table is like rotated 90 degrees right, again, because this is Japanese. So if you rotate the whole image 90 degrees to the left, you're going to have the same orientation that you would in English. Um, and so, you know, reading from top to bottom, the pink are the variable names and the green are the variable text but they use exactly the same font. And so how is it that as a human, you would distinguish them? The reason is that the pink, the variable names are not indented, whereas the variable values, like if they wrap onto multiple lines, kind of they are indented. Um, and so like, if you look over here, um, you see like this variable name wraps onto multiple lines and when it starts on the next line, there's an indent, right? Um, and so we could just label a bunch of data. And if you labeled en enough data, the model would learn um, that variable names are not indented and the green variable values are indented. But you'd have to label quite a bit of data. And it turns out this is actually like a really strong rule. Um, the variable names are never indented and the variable text is always indented. And even if the document is kind of skewed when you sc scan it, that indent is large enough that it's still going to look um, like the variable text is indented. And so what we do is in the first pass, when we're using deep learning for object detection, the green and the pink are the same category. They're just a text category. Um, but then, like once we've actually recognized everything, we are going to use a rule to tell pink boxes from the green boxes. And that rule is that the pink boxes are not indented. If text is not indented and it's at the top of the column, that is a, um, that is a variable name. Um, whereas if text at the top of the column is indented, that's a variable value. And so um, it's best to use relative coordinates rather than hard coding the values. It's just more generalizable. And so we look at the aspect ratio of the columns and we divide each one into a 16 by 40 grid. Um, and in the text columns, um, even when the column images are quite skewed, variable names always start in the top at the top of the row, whereas variable values are all the other blocks that do not start at the top of the row. So you can see all the pinks, those are blocks that start at the top of the row, the greens do not. So you can see here an example of those grids overlaid um, and we just see whether or not the coordinates um, of the box are in that top row of grid cells. And if they are, we switch it to being a variable name. If not, it stays as variable text. Um, and so this shows that there's not like really hard and fast uh, rules about when to use rules. And so what I take away is that the human brain is really, really good at filtering out noise and heterogeneity um, and usually on like a subconscious level, like the world is full of noise and you've learned to ab abstract from that noise and pay attention to what matters. Um, and that's like, you know, part of what you need to, to uh, successfully function in the world. Um, and so if you've never processed images before, you may have never stopped to think about how good humans are at doing this. Um, and so when deciding to, to use rules, I recommend looking very carefully to make sure the rule is actually universal. Um, there aren't too many special cases and exceptions. There's not exceptions to the exceptions. 
And the, it needs to be strong enough that it won't be swamped by noise that results from document scanning um, or you know whatever other noise might be in the information that you want to process. Okay, which turns to an important point about why rules fail, which are essentially the same reason, complexity and noise. Um, and noise introduces complexity. And so this is you know, an example of the a zoomed out example of the, the firm level reports that I was just showing you. This is the zoomed in example. Clearly this is complex, okay? This is orders of magnitude more complex than a single column book. Um, this is, applies to all sorts of documents. Another project where digitizing historical newspapers. We have like 7,000 different newspapers over different time periods. They all use their own layout. It would just be totally impossible to extract layouts from kind of this sort of document, like surely with rules. Um, but complexity is not kind of the only enemy. I'll just say, oh yeah, I was gonna say briefly that complexity is not limited to layout detection. Um, there's 60,000 words in the English language, which means there's a lot of different ways to say the same thing. Um, in commercial applications, modern NLP just massively outperforms things like keyword search if you're looking to retrieve information um, because uh, the, the English language, any language, you know, almost any language is, is full of complexity. Okay. Um, Oftentimes the information we're working with is, is very noisy. So in the case of historical documents, um, there's a huge amount of noise, you know, essentially that comes from the scanning um, of the documents. There's noise that in the original documents too, like typesetting historically did not allow for the precision of modern printing. People just laid it out by hand. It wasn't done with rules using the computer. Um, over and under inking, um, are common. Um, and when you combine that with text bleed because the paper is old or because the way that the scanner settings were set, it's really difficult to like remove that just purely with rules. Because if you remove everything like lighter than this value of gray, you're gonna take away part of the strokes of your characters because of under inking. And you can do something more sophisticated like something called adaptive thresholding, which you can also do in OpenCV, but it's just, it's hard to get rid of the noise because um, it looks, you know, similar to what legitimate information looks like. Um, if you didn't remove the binding to scan the book, you're taking a three-dimensional object and you're projecting it into two-dimensional space. And that can introduce um, page warping, um, skew, things like that. Um, uh, many scans that you can go and get off the internet are in poor quality, especially if they were scanned cheaply and binarized. I mean, I mentioned Hathi Trust last class and I think like in our experience like you know over half of what you try to go there and read is like illegible because they did um they just uh did such a cheap job at the scanning they binarized it they used the wrong threshold and like half the information just disappears um you know old documents might have you know somebody's gone to the library and taken that book and written all over it like with their pencil like just all kinds of idiosyncratic things um and again this isn't limited to documents it isn't limited to things that are historical suppose you want to go and do nlp on tweets um as you can imagine people have all sorts of typos and spelling mistakes they use weird abbreviations you know it's a very sort of a very similar amount of noise that enters in um, and so in some ways, like this is kind of, I think, an interesting parallel um, to um, a really interesting book by James Scott that talks about the idea of legibility. Um, it's called Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. And so just in a nutshell, um, what he argues is that social planners who were trying to kind of make societies um, better, more legible, um, simpler, so like they'd be easy to tax and to control, etc. Um, they go and they look at some complex reality and they just completely fail to understand all the subtleties that make the complex order function. And then they use authoritarian power to impose a radically simple, orderly, rule-based vision that fails miserably because reality is more complicated than what they see. Um, so a classical example that he gives is that um, these uh, forest planners in 19th century Germany um, cut down these 
forests, which are complex ecosystems, and they put in these monocrop forests. And so they grew like Norway spruce, and that's the only tree that grows in the forest. And then it turns out to be a disaster because if you get some sort of pest, that's well suited to the one tree, it kills off the entire forest, it leaches the soil, all these bad things happen because while like a forest might look disorderly, um, everything there has its purpose and it's all interconnected, right? And he gives lots of examples. He talks about, you know, Stalin, um, lots of examples from social science and basically the general idea is like, we look at reality, we think we can have some rule based approximation to it, but actually things are massively more complex and the entire scheme fails miserably, um, which I think kind of reminded me of efforts to apply rules to, you know, processing information, you know, seeing like a researcher how your rule based scheme to process certain information will fail. Um, unless your document really is very simple, a few sweeping rules are not going to capture its complexity. Um, and so what deep learning does is it's essentially about making, you know, millions and millions of tiny adjustments to move towards a desired objective. Um, it's essentially the antithesis of grand sweeping rules. Um, and so I think that kind of these ideas, I mean, they, they apply more broadly to a lot of things. Of course, when we're doing, you know, some kind of social engineering, um, we don't have an ability to run tens of millions of small experiments and we may not even agree what the objective is or what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but there are some parallels. Okay. Um, so fortunately, there's an alternative to rules, which is deep learning. Um, it has the potential to produce results that are just more robust noise and complexity and has already done that in many other domains and commercial applications, images, audios, videos, NLP, um, which all have applications to social science. Um, and so there's a nature review article on the reading list um, by um, uh, authors who were kind of termed the godfathers of deep learning and they essentially provide um, a succinct summary. And so they say, you know, the key aspect of deep learning is that these layers of features are not designed by human engineers. They are learned from the data using a general purpose learning procedure. Um, deep learning is not free. It does have requirements. You need a lot of labeled data. You need really a lot of computational power and you need to have the appropriate architecture for your model. Um, as social scientists, fortunately, we don't have to solve these problems on our own. Um, there's cloud services that put previously unimaginable computing power at our fingertips, um, or you could potentially get your own GPU. Um, the underlying architectures of these models have already been studied extensively by computer scientists. There's open source code that you can go and download that works really well. Um, and so essentially a lot of that work has been done, but really like what we as social scientists need to do is to go the final model and have the data needed um, to train models geared towards our applications. And again, here we're not working from scratch, you know, Google already but you know, who knows how much data and computational, uh, com you know, and compute into training the off the shelf version of Google BERT for NLP. Um, but it, it, it will need to be fine tuned to our context. And the aim of this course is to provide um, enough knowledge to be able to set up the problem in a way that makes sense and fine tune models to your own application, as well as thinking about how do we create labeled data efficiently. Um, and so um, Jeff Hinton, who was kind of one of the founders of deep learning, you know, put it similarly. He said, he was asked, why didn't deep learning take off in the 1980s? And he said, our labeled data sets were thousands of times too small. Our computers were millions of times too slow. We initialized the weights in a stupid way. And we used the wrong type of nonlinearity where the last two points go back to kind of what architecture you need. Um, and so what do you do um, when labeled data are limited? You could use an off the shelf pre-trained model without additional fine tuning. I think there, there's, you know, maybe there's some applications where that could work. Uh, maybe some of the zero shot stuff in NLP or where there's a pre-trained model on a context similar to, you, to yours, but you usually, it, usually it won't give you quite the performance that you're looking for. 
You could annotate samples by hand using an active learning framework, your tour social science documents, which we'll talk about, or you could use data augmentation to generate samples that are similar, that, that simulate the data you want to create. And these existing methods um, don't necessarily translate well to what we want to do, but we'll talk a little bit about this as well. Okay. And so finally, you know, you might be wondering, does this actually matter? You know, I have papers to write. Um, it seems intuitive to apply rules. Why do I need to care about deep learning? Obviously, it's going to depend on the documents you're processing, how noisy they are, how much that noise affects your downstream analyses. Like if you're trying to digitize a box of text that's all words, maybe you don't care if there's text plate. It doesn't matter so much. Maybe it matters more to a table. Um, but I will say that getting things right upstream can save you a lot of time when it comes to actually doing your analyses and reduce the probability that your data is full of measurement error and you just get a bunch of, of noisy mush. Um, data curation can be incredibly time consuming, um, but worthwhile um, if it allows you to answer questions that are meaningful. It's also not easier that, it's not obvious that rules are easier. Um, they may have fewer startup costs, um, but it can come down to manually spending time correcting problems um, versus making investments um, in deep learning that are ultimately gonna scale um, a lot better to other data that you wanna use and really to allow you to process kind of big data on a large scale, as opposed to maybe doing you know, more, more narrowly uh, tailored um, use cases.